The hip is a multi-axial synovial ball and socket articulation between the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the pelvis. The hip joint's bony architecture and soft tissue structures create a combination of mobility and stability that is unique to the lower extremity, allowing for flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, internal and external rotation. And from an athletic standpoint, housing the body's center of gravity, nearly every athletic movement requires force generation or transfer through this structure. And just like the main mast of a sailing ship, a well-balanced pelvis necessitates a complex orchestration of different joints, ligaments, and muscle groups, allowing for safe and effective force transfer through what is a very dynamic joint. But that is where the pretty anatomical pictures end, and it seems almost inevitable that at some point in time, we are presented with an injury report that looks something like this. Out, general adductor strain. Out, general hip impingement. Out, general hip irritation. And of particular interest here is the term general. Due to the complexity of the hip and the potential for upstream and downstream complications to interact forces at the hip, there are a vast number of potential complications that can present themselves. Due to this, it is often difficult for the medical community to establish a consensus on presentation and causation, something that ultimately influences decisions made by sports medicine and ourselves as strength and conditioning professionals. Now, this is not a good thing when you think about it, since our job, in partnership with the staff of sports medicine, is to maximize player availability to our coaching staff at all times. And this is a pretty serious issue when it comes to the hip and groin. In fact, according to the literature, hip and groin injuries rank fourth only behind general knee injury, ACL-specific knee injury, and bone fracture in terms of time loss from sport. Groin pain accounts for approximately 5-18% to 18 of all athletic injuries, with kicking sports generally producing most of these injuries. In fact, the literature indicates that nearly one-third of soccer players will develop some kind of hip or groin pathology across their career. Now, unlike these acute inciting event injuries, such as an ACL tear or a bone fracture, the more common athletic hip, hip and groin injuries tend to be insidious in nature and present themselves over a relatively long period of time. This is unique, since the athlete is often able to continue to participate and perform at a high level, thus resulting in underreporting of pain. As the athlete continues to participate in high-intensity training and competition, the condition is exacerbated and the pain potentially migrates along a myofascial chain. Ultimately, the coach or athlete recognizes a significant decrease in performance, commonly straight-line running speed or change of direction competency, paired with a pain that does not subside after rest, which ultimately leads to the reporting of symptoms to sports medicine. At this point, we can begin the process of evaluation, diagnosis, treatment, and load modification. Now, I don't mean for this presentation to focus on unhealthy hips, hip injury, or return to play, but I do think it is important to understand injury so we can do our best to mitigate those risk factors. So what are some key risk factors? Clearly, the sport is a risk factor. There are a higher presentation of hip and groin injuries in soccer players than in swimmers. The sporting actions are the clear drivers here. Athletes who play sports with repeated high accelerations, decelerations, changes of direction, kicking, twisting, jumping, turning, landing, are at a higher risk. What about male versus female? Well, according to the British Medical Journal Review, published in 2015, there is moderate evidence to suggest that men have a higher incidence of groin injuries than women when playing the same sport. Our genetic makeup and its influence on our musculoskeletal anatomy. How does the shape of the head of our femur sit on our acetabulum, for example? Driven by our genetic makeup is ligamentous laxity. This is an undeniable risk factor, particularly apparent at the pubic symphysis, where shear forces can be extremely high, especially during asymmetric cutting tasks. What about the resting length of our muscle tendon units? This is influenced by both nature and nurture. Let's take a look at a study that illustrates this point. In this unique study, they compared the effects of long-term wearing of high heels on muscle and tendon architecture and function. After reviewing the data, they concluded that long-term use of high heel shoes resulted in a shortened gastroc fascicle length and increased Achilles tendon stiffness, contributing to a reduction in the ankle active range of motion. But the most important takeaway from this study is that the results strongly support the hypothesis that muscle structure may adapt to a chronic change in functional demand. So why am I referencing this study, and what has it got to do with athletics? Well, to draw parallel to this study, might something similar be happening at the hip? 
Is the high heel shoe to the gastroc and Achilles tendon what the chair is to the resting length of our hip flex, uh, muscle tendon unit? To give it some context, over the course of a student athlete's day, they may spend three to four hours in class in a hip flex position, an hour in meetings in a hip flex position, an hour or so eating, and two to three hours working on projects and assignments in a hip flex position. You understand the point. What about biomechanics? Our biomechanics clearly have a huge influence on force generation and transfer at the hip. Now this is not an extensive list, but let's take a look at three biomechanical dysfunctions we may see more often across an athletic population. First, dysfunctions in lumbopelvic control, particularly anterior pelvic tilt. To review, anterior pelvic tilt happens when the pelvis rotates anteriorly around the hip joint in the transverse axis. We get a shortening of the iliosciatus, resulting in a loss of extensibility, a shortening of the rectus femoris, a shortening of the adductors, leading to a potential increase in valgus tendencies, and a shortening and tightening of spinal erectors. Conversely, the abdominals, gluteals, and hamstrings are either lengthened, weakened, or under-recruited. What about malicious misalignment syndrome? This describes a set of anatomical conditions affecting joint positioning and force transfer. First, we have an internal rotation of the femur, resulting in valgus positioning of the knees. In some cases, there is tibial bowing, leading to a hyperpronated feet and a collapsed arch. And finally, we have pelvic obliquity or uneven pelvis. This is more of an extreme example, but something you might see in sports that are heavily asymmetric in nature. With pelvic obliquity, there is an instability in the hip. This may be as a result of tightness of the hip flexors, lower back, or hamstring muscles, leading to one pelvic rim sitting higher than the other. This dysfunction is exacerbated during walking or running. Over time, the demands of an unbalanced running stride causes the adductor muscles to tighten, limiting external hip rotation, shortening and tightening of the iliosciatus, and which leads to anterior pelvic tilt. The result is an increased spinal curvature and continuous tension on the muscles of the lower back, causing elements of the musculoskeletal system to function at unnatural angles to each other. Strength and appropriate recruitment of surrounding muscular, as well as the mobility about the joint, are clear risk factors, and this is something that will constitute the majority of the demonstrations we'll look at today. What about training stress balance? Well, here's a graph from Marquette men's basketball from last season, in which we depict the relationship between acute versus chronic load. In short, are we building resilience in a safe manner? Are we preparing our athletes for a worst case scenario? And are we training hard consistently? Noting that consistently does not mean constantly. And finally, environmental conditions and footwear. Just as hard surfaces are a risk factor for the pelvis and groin, a ground which is uneven or too soft will also overload the unstable pelvis. Similarly, footwear being the only buffer between the environment and the musculoskeletal system will play a role in force acceptance, distribution, and overall mechanics. So before we move on to our practical demonstrations, a little bit of context and guidance. First, there is no one right way to do things. I believe there are some wrong ways to do things, but certainly not one right way. Note that also this is not an extensive list. Secondly, even though much of what we've talked about today is centered around injury and injury risk factors, the following is not designed to be a return to play program. Certainly, some techniques can be used in both settings or modified to fit a return to play protocol, but the focus of the following content is on fortifying an existing healthy hip and groin. Thirdly, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. This is more of a reminder for myself, to be honest. The following demonstrations feature more unique or creative exercises to challenge the athlete through multiple planes. It is, however, important to adhere to the foundational principles of strength and conditioning when creating a holistic sports performance program. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, our lane departure warning. We, as strength and conditioning coaches, are very passionate about what we do. We're motivated to do everything we can to help our athletes stay healthy and perform to their highest potential. We are not, however, trained as sports medicine professionals or physical therapists. We should be careful not to work within our jurisdiction and provide excellent strength and conditioning services and not just mediocre mixture of strength and conditioning, physical therapy and sports medicine.
We should aim to work alongside professionals in all fields and strengthen lines of communications as often as possible. So let's take a look at some movement prep, prehab or activation exercises. First, our keep it simple stupid list. Hurdle series, we go forwards, backwards, over, under, two feet in a hole, one foot in a hole, track hurdles, mini hurdles. Glute bridge series, we'll talk, take a look at glute bridge series in our live demonstrations. Mini band series, monster walks, sidestepping, knee screws, etc. Dead bug, bird dog, and clamshell can be used across all settings, strength conditioning, sports medicine, and physical therapy in different ways that challenge mobility, stability, and resistance. Okay, so let's get started with these, uh, these live demonstrations. We have our sports performance intern coach, John, with us right now, and he's gonna help us out with some of these demonstrations here. So first of all, we're gonna look at um, maintaining a neutral pelvis and a neutral spine, which is really important for the majority of the movements that we do in the weight room. So first of all, we're gonna get into a very basic quadruped position in all four positions, whereby John has his knees stacked underneath his hips, and his hands stacked directly underneath his shoulders. Now at this point, we're just gonna ask the athlete to explore those end ranges of motion, uh, particularly hyperflexion and hyperextension. So this is our usual kind of cat-cow, cat-camel, I call it scaredy cat silverback to illustrate the point of the movement. And we'll ask our athletes to explore those end ranges of motions to, to understand what they feel like. After we've done this a few times, then we'll try and ask our athletes to come back to a neutral position, so a neutral spine, and see if they can find it. Neutral spine, neutral pelvis. Now, John, being the athlete, is pretty good at getting to that position, but quite often we'll see they, they might be in a bit more of a flex position than they realize, or more of an extended position than they, than they realize. So one thing that we can do here is we can use this marked dowel rod, now this is marked really for the purposes of, uh, of this demonstration, but you can certainly do that yourself. And we're gonna use this to establish points of contact with the athlete. So first of all, we're gonna look at a couple of different points of contact. The black tape illustrates where we should have contact in a neutral hip, neutral pelvis, neutral spine position. So we have contact on the top of the sacrum, lumbar spine, middle of the thoracic spine, and the occipital lobe of the skull. So we're establishing contact points there, and that's gonna help your athlete understand where their neutral spine, neutral pelvis is. Now, if we go into, uh, into flexion here with John, yep, yep, yep. See, we lose points here, the sacrum. We've maybe got a little bit of contact still at the uh, lumbar spine. We're losing some of the thoracic spine, and then we're losing the, uh, the occipital uh, lobe as well. And then if we go into um, extension, we establish contact points with the opposite two and lose the two middle, right? So we have sacral contact, occipital contact, but then we lose the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine as well. So just a nice little tool to help your athletes understand with the tactile stimulus where that neutral spine, neutral pelvis is. So from here, now when we've established that, what we can do is we can start to isolate or dissociate the, the pelvic movement from that of the, the spine. So often our thoracic movement, uh, works together alongside our pelvic movement, but we wanna make sure we can isolate pelvic movements too. So we're gonna use this foam roller. I'm gonna block it up a little bit so John maintains a nice neutral position, especially with his arms. We slide this underneath. Now, what we're looking for is contact here with the foam roller, foam roller on his sternum, on his chest, and he's gonna maintain that contact. Now we've got it blocked up to a sufficient height whereby he's still in a neutral position, he's not reaching for it or, or arching his back to maintain that contact. Right, it's a neutral position for him and now we have that good neutral thoracic spine here and now we're gonna to look to isolate uh, pelvic tilt. So we're gonna look for anterior pelvic tilt and posterior pelvic tilt. So John's just gonna work through those different ranges of motion, maintaining contact with the foam roller on his sternum, but now he's dissociating lumbar spine uh, and the sacrum from the rest of his thoracic spine, so pelvis, and we're looking at that pelvic tilt there. Again, more of a tactile stimulus to help the athlete understand uh, what he or she should or shouldn't be feeling. So once we've played around with this for a little bit, now we can start to go into um, more of an upright position. So we'll first we'll go to a kneeling position. Again, quite basic. 
Now here, we're just looking to, again, maintain that neutral spine, the thoracic spine, and work with that pelvic tilt, the anterior pelvic tilt and posterior pelvic tilt. So again, you'll see as John does this, you can see engaging of the glutes as he goes into that um, posterior pelvic tilt and then through uh, anterior pelvic tilt too. So again, staying upright. Now here, sometimes you might have the athlete kind of regress a little bit. They might start to push their, um, push their butt backwards, okay, to establish that anterior pelvic tilt and thrust forward into that posterior and get hyperextension through the spine, which isn't what we want. So again, you can provide other tactile stimuluses such as a dowel rod at the glute level or the mid, uh, mid lumbar spine level so they're not pushing backwards or, or pulling away from it. Okay, so a couple of different options for you there. Again, uh, progression from this, we go into a half kneeling position after that. Again, just a little bit more complex. Now we have a bit more of an asymmetric pelvis where one, uh, one leg is in flexion, the other one more so in, in an anatomical neutral position. And we're looking to, again, uh, rock into anterior pelvic tilt and posterior pelvic tilt while trying to maintain as much as possible that neutral spine. And then finally, obviously coming to our standing position, double leg standing position. Again, baby steps, um, nothing groundbreaking here. Now we're looking at anterior, posterior pelvic tilt um, on that bipedal standing position, which is typically where we're gonna be most of the time. Good job. So here in this position, um, Kelly Starrett talks about two bowls filled with water. One is at the level of the diaphragm and one is at the level of the hips. And if you imagine you have these two open top bowls, if you go into anterior pelvic tilt and, lumbar, and sorry, thoracic extension, you're gonna spill water out of the front side of the lower bowl and out of the back side of the higher bowl. Likewise, if we reverse that and we go into thoracic flexion and posterior pelvic tilt, then we start to lose water out of the back side of the bowl on, the, on the, um, the lower bowl and the front side of the bowl at the higher bowl. So it's just another kind of piece of imagery the athlete might use to help them to establish that neutral spine, neutral pelvis. So now's the time to put some of this into practice. A common activation series for the hip and mobilization series is a glute bridge series. So we're gonna look at that now. So a typical glute bridge that you might see in a weight room might look a little something like this, where we have poor pelvic control and over-involvement of the spine and often hyperextension of the spine. So you might see something a little like this. We're pushing through the toes. We have poor glute activity and we have overextension, like we talked about of that lumbar thoracic spine right there. So we're gonna look at this in a little bit more detail and a bit of a uh, series here. Um, to progress the glute bridge. So first of all, uh, taking a leaf out of um, Brett Contreras' book, um, we're gonna look at our positioning in the glute bridge first. So we're looking to establish a couple of different points of contact. First and probably most importantly, the heels. We're really gonna drive through the heels and not through the toes of the feet. If you wanted to have your feet flat, absolutely fine, but emphasize driving more so through the heels than through the toes. Um, we've also got good contact with the shoulder blades and the upper back and contact with the, the back of the head too. Notice John's arms are about roughly 45 degrees from his body. We're looking to establish a kind of a triangle between uh, his biceps and the side of his body. His fists are gonna be clenched above his elbows, okay, and he's also gonna tuck his chin too. So now this establishes a really nice neutral spine, and he's ready to, to activate the glutes and go into a nice glute bridge here. So first of all, he's gonna activate the glutes and go into that almost a bit of a posterior pelvic tilt a little bit, just to activate the glutes and then rise up into this top position, all the while driving through his elbows, heels, and head. And then we come back down again for that second rep. Okay, so now after a, a simple double leg glute bridge here, then we look to progress this to what we call a, a Buddha or a butterfly glute bridge. Now John's gonna bring the soles of his feet together, heels as close to his butt as he can. The rest of the position stays the same. Now in this position, the lower back and the lumbar spine is going to want to um, come off the ground a little bit too much. He goes into that extension, but he's really got to drive that to the ground, maintain neutral spine, neutral pelvis, and also engage the abdominals here as well. So again, he looks to engage the glutes, more of a posterior pelvic tilt as he rises up into that glute bridge here in this Buddha bridge. Again, simple variation, nothing groundbreaking. From here, we're gonna go into um, single leg bridges. So this has all, all been uh, symmetrical, now we're going to an asymmetric glute bridge. For this one, I like to use a little cross ball. So give this to John. This is just gonna sit in the hip and it's just gonna fo uh, force the athlete to focus on maintaining an active flexion of the hip and not just a kind of passive flexion in there. So a real active flexion of the hip whilst he extends through the other, uh, the other glute. Good, again, all the same principles applying here, really driving through his elbows as well, fists above his elbows, chin tucked, good. 
From here, we can uh, emphasize this position a little bit more um, by providing resistance in this single leg glute bridge series. So just a simple banded exercise here. We're just using a, a light orange band for uh, demonstration purposes. But John can again move through a similar range of motion, getting up into that ultimately that single leg glute bridge position. But he begins now in an almost more of a neutral pelvis, where it's a bit more symmetrical and comes up into an asymmetric pelvis with one, uh, one side flex in flexion and the other side in extension. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a bit of a, um, a hip flexion series. Quite often in sport, we're always chasing triple extension for the purposes of acceleration. And we often forget about hip flexion, being able to maintain good postural integrity um, in the hip during flexion activities. So this is a, a series that I might use at the beginning uh, of a lift, a little bit more of a kind of a activation series, um, but a good one for uh, striking good positions and helping the athlete remember those, that postural alignment too. So here on the rack, pretty simple setup. Uh, we've just got an orange band attached to the bottom of the rack, and we're going to use this PVC pipe or a dowel rod, whichever you would prefer, um, uh, for striking these good positions. So first of all, uh, we, we're asking our athlete, John, just to stand at the top of the platform. He's going to uh, keep his um, right foot at the top of the platform and step behind with his left foot. So he's going to be one foot distance away from the top of the platform there. He's going to grab the PVC pipe above his head. At a comfortable distance, he's going to be in an overhead position here. And then quite simply, all we're going to ask him to do is lean forward into the rack, maintaining good spinal alignment, neutral pelvis, and he's going to raise his right foot into, uh, into a flex position, or his right hip into a flex position. And we're looking for about a quarter of air underneath the standing heel as well um, for this good sprint position. So now we've got alignment with the ankle, knee, hip, shoulder, all the way through the fist here. We might hold this position for between 20 seconds uh, to a minute. So a nice position here. Again, the, the most important thing we're looking for here is having parallel shoulder and pelvis and have that new, uh, parallel to the ground as well. So we don't want to see favoring you know, one side or the other, sagging shoulders, anything like that, because that might, might suggest we have a, a poor link in our chain. OK, good. So now our progression from here. We're going to start using this uh, band at the bottom here. So we're going to strike another isometric position with the band. You know, you might grab uh, one band or two bands, and now we just have a little bit more resistance, and that's going to force the athlete to maintain a little bit more neutral pelvis and focus on that, and obviously a little bit harder here as well. So again, we might regress backwards in time, holding for 20 seconds, and then start to creep up too. From here, then, we might add a bit more of a rep scheme. So instead of having an isometric hold position, we might move through ranges of motion because we know it's a little bit harder to maintain integrity in the pelvis, um, the spine, and the shoulders during movement. So now, We'll start slowly, and we're just going to hook that one band again, strike our, our upward position, but now we're just going to move through that rep scheme. And I'm, again, looking at this pelvis and making sure we're not shifting side to side or dropping the, sh the two shoulder blades here either. Good. And finally, you can progress this even further to stepping two feet away from the rack as opposed to one foot. So stepping behind twice, one, two, good. And then hooking with his left foot there. So quite a simple progression, again, just for a little bit more hip flexion. Um, there are obviously many other movements we look at with hip flexion for more strengthening, but this is a bit more activation and striking good positions. I think we do a good job as strength and conditioning coaches of targeting the development of lower limb musculature. Here are the big rock movements that I favor. Squats, including but not limited to front squats, back squats, split or rear foot elevated squats. Lunges, multi-directional, including step-ups. Deadlifts, whether straight bar, trap bar, regular or sumo. Hip hinges, including but not limited to good mornings, RDLs, kettlebell swings, reverse hypers and back extensions. Loaded carries, which we will touch on in the live demonstrations, including farmer walks, suitcase carries, overhead carries and zerker carries. Jumping and landing movements, including the Olympic lifts and other triple extension and triple flexion derivatives. And, if you have the capability, sled drags and pushes. As I mentioned previously, I think we do a good job of developing the lower limb musculature. As a result, the live demonstrations to follow will not focus on these foundational lifts, but will look to strengthen the chassis of the body, allowing the primary engines of the shoulders and the hips to do work.
Okay, so now we're gonna move more so into our strengthening series. We're gonna start off with a very basic position, the kneeling power press. Uh, again, this is gonna force us to maintain good pelvic alignment and good spinal alignment um, while counteracting the torque of the band in this paloff press. So simple kneeling position. What we're gonna do here is gonna ask John to sit backwards first towards his heels and then become tall by engaging his glutes. That's gonna allow him to focus on uh, maintaining that neutral pelvis and then press out into our paloff press here. Okay, again, the usual paloff press, fists in line with the middle of the chest and we can hold for three to five seconds, whatever you might like to do there. Okay, again, we're sitting backwards all the while, relaxing in that position coming tall, being pulled through the top of the head, engaging the glutes and pushing out. Again, very simple. I'd start with this one, very basic. From here now, from the symmetrical position, we become a little bit more asymmetric and we're gonna go into a, a half kneeling position. Okay. Again, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna rock backwards to become tall again, engaging that left glute, pressing out in the middle. Okay. John will work through some simple progressions from this here now. So he's going to press down. I'm going to go into an overhead position first. Okay. So now he's controlling that movement in an overhead position, not allowing that lateral flexion to take over. And then finally, he's going to come overhead and look for an outward flexion. So now he's actually actively flexing here in the obliques to the outside, maintaining good spinal alignment and uh, par uh, parallel pelvis to the ground too. Now John will show you a poor demonstration of this one here whereby he's gonna shoot his hips towards the rack, overcompensating on this side, right, and not staying tight and neutral uh, through the spine either. So lastly, he's finished with that good rep. Just demonstrate that again. See how his, uh, his pelvis has stayed neutral in the middle. Okay, so now obviously we still got that knee on the ground, we're pretty stable, our center of mass is low uh, in our base of support. We're going to rise up a little bit to progress this. So we're going to go into a split stance position or a split lunge position. Okay, and we can go through exactly the same movement. So we've got our press from our chest, we've got overhead, and then we've also got that lateral flexion component too. Okay, pretty simple. But again, still a pretty stable position now. We're going to introduce this slider. Uh, for John, and we're going to work through more of a dynamic position. We're going to use exactly the same series in terms of the paloff press, but now as John presses out, he's starting with double leg stance, he's going to move backwards into that split stance position. Now this is going to put emphasis on this outside knee and this outside hip complex too. As he pushes backwards and he gets that lateral torque with the band in the paloff press, this knee is working really hard not to become valgus. It really wants to shoot in towards that big toe. But John is working hard on this outside hip here to work through uh, flexion, uh, sorry, external rotation, making sure his knee does not collapse uh, into the middle there. Okay. Learning from yoga here, we're going to use uh, a warrior movement, a warrior two movement, uh, again, to teach uh, and establish control through the knee and the pelvis and, and look at how the, the hip actually influences the knee. So right here, we're just going to use our, our smart slider again. Um, John's going to stand on it with one foot, keeping the other foot grounded. Now, what he's going to do is move from a standing position into a warrior two position. It's going to be long and low. As he lunges backwards, he's opening out his hips and his shoulders to one side of the room and then he comes back to that tall position. So we're looking for that long and slow on the way out, mobility aspect, and then fast on the way back in to, be, to become tall there. So John's gonna go through a, a few reps here while we talk about a couple of things. Firstly, when he opens his hips and his shoulders out to one side of the room, his, his left knee, his standing leg, is gonna wanna collapse and become valgus towards that big toe. But really we're looking to fight that. John's doing a good job, job of keeping his knee in line with his toe uh, and forcing that external rotation through his left hip there. We're looking for long and slow in this first piece of the movement for that mobility aspect, for active mobility, active stretch, and then fast coming to that tall position, again, to challenge that stability through the hip. Good, from here now, uh, we might progress and add a little bit of resistance and loading. So we can use three pieces of equipment. We've got uh, our band tied to the rack of the rig. We've got our kettlebell for the loading component, and then we've also got our slider as well. So you can see everything uh, John is using is on the inside, it's close to the rack. So the band's around his left foot, he's on the slider on his left foot, and the kettlebell is in his left hand. So now what we're going to do here is it really just looks like a single leg squat and a lateral lunge combined. John's going to uh, squat through his right knee and hip, lunge out the side with the left, and then low and slow and pull back in fast to get tall again, you know, similar to our last movement. So again, that band is just resisting the adductors of the left leg. Okay, and that kettlebell is, is loading really that squat position a little bit too. So again, we're looking for keeping parallel hips and shoulders parallel to the ground, not favoring one side or the other, and coming straight up from that single leg squat position. 
All right, next up, an oldie but a goodie, the Copenhagen adductor exercise. Now here we've just got a, a rear foot elevated ball bearing attachment to the rack here. Uh, John's going to move into what is really a, a side plank position. His top foot, his ankle is going to be on the attachment here and he's got good ground and good contact with his, his right forearm there. Now to begin the position here, we've established contact as well with that bottom leg, uh, particularly the outside of the foot and the right hip. First part of movement, this is a two part series in this movement. First up, we're gonna establish midline stability and control by raising the pelvis off the ground, pushing through the outside of that right foot down there. We're straight here. And then secondly, we're bringing ankle to ankle, looking at the adductor uh, of this leg here. Really good control, almost a robotic movement where we come up with, a, um, with good pace and down with good pace as well, good tempo. Good job. Okay, so if you don't have one of these attachments, you can also use a partner. This is quite a versatile movement because you can use this on the road as well. Um, so quite simply, I'm now going to become the, the Bulgarian attachment for John. So one contact at the ankle, one contact at the knee, and then he's going to perform exactly the same series. Good. Okay, now we're going to get a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more dynamic with our movement. Uh, this is a movement I particularly like to program. This is what we call a plate RDL, step up and reach. So quite simply, we've got a DC block. We've got six DC blocks, which is an appropriate height for John. Again, just a green plate, 10 kilo plate for demonstration purposes, but you can really load this up. So as you'll see, this is a pretty dynamic movement, uh, striking a lot of nice positions. So John's going to grab that plate. He's going to stand reasonably close to the box, about one to two feet away from it. Plate is at his chest to begin with, his elbows behind him and his shoulder blades retracted here. And again, got that good uh, neutral thoracic spine and pelvis. So John's going to go through a couple of reps here as we talk, talk about it. It's quite a dynamic movement, so I don't want to stop him in different positions. So first of all, he's going to move into this nice, long, single leg RDL position before he goes into his step up and reach, as you see. So with the RDL, it should be like a teeter-totter movement. Okay, As his heel moves six inches backwards, his shoulder should be moving at the same rate six inches forwards. Get that long position and then moving forward quickly onto the box, step up and reach. So we have hip flexion to begin with, then suddenly extension and finally flexion again, just like it's kind of almost a sprinting or an acceleration series. So again, this, this requires a lot of postural control, but also an aggressive uh, uh, extension through the hip and then finally flexion through the hip too. So John's focusing on hitting that top position and maintaining it for a second before he steps off the box for his next rep. Okay, next up, a, uh, a loaded carry series. I really favor the loaded carries. I think uh, we used to use them a lot. I think they've disappeared uh, recently, but I really encourage using loaded carries again um, for challenging the stability through the spine, the pelvis, and the shoulders too. So um, obviously we have our farmer carry, we have our suitcase carry. Uh, here's another version of the carry, what I call a high-low carry, um, which again, challenges that kind of axial stability uh, in multiple different planes. So John's going to demonstrate here. He's got one kettlebell um, in one hand, which is heavier, his lower hand, and a slightly lighter one in his upper hand. Now John's using a kettlebell here, so he can do a, a kettlebell weighted carry or a bottoms up carry, again, looking at that shoulder stability. And he's just going to take a really slow walk here and really focus on keeping his uh, hips parallel to his shoulders, uh, which are all parallel to the ground. Good, so he'll take a little lap round here. Again, really good, slow, controlled movements. If you don't have kettlebells, you can obviously use dumbbells, um, but we're just using a kettlebell here again to add the extra component of uh, wrist and shoulder stability to it as well. So this is our high-low carry. Okay, so then progression from this, uh, we might go into that suitcase carry actually, but now we're gonna add a band to that top hand. So I'm just gonna de demonstrate here with John. Previously, John had um, lateral flexion uh, he was trying to control that lateral flexion on both sides. Um, but now we're going to add this band, and you're going to see it's going to create torque into more of an extension torque and a rotational torque along with that flexion component too. So now we're challenging a couple more planes. All right, so we're going to band up this, uh, this top hand here. I'm going to grab it and be his partner. I've got my kettlebell in my left hand. John's got his kettlebell in his left hand, and now we're banding that top. We've got good tension on the band, and we're just going to mimic Mirror, mirror image our walking series here as well, rounding the corner. So now I'm being pulled forward into flexion while John is being pulled backwards towards me and extension. Good, and likewise, we can turn around here, so we'll turn towards the mirrors. Yep, and now 
I am challenged with that, uh, that extension component. I've got to maintain that. And John is being challenged more so with his flexion component. Before we begin the soft tissue series, I would like to bring your attention to a few principles of soft tissue management. Here's a great quote from Kelly Sturette to establish a guiding mindset for soft tissue work. When performing soft tissue manipulations, it's important that we make meaningful and progressive changes to the underlying soft tissue structures that we are targeting. We should educate our athletes on the goals of the soft tissue work and may need to provide direction on how to differentiate between discomfort and pain. Athletes should steer clear of tingling, radiating or burning sensations when performing soft tissue manipulations and should be encouraged to individualize techniques and positions based on their individual needs. Secondly, just as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the human body is a complex example of interconnected and interrelated systems. To this end, when implementing soft tissue management strategies, it is important to consider that where the rat gets in is not necessarily where it chews, meaning a presentation of discomfort in the hip may be relieved in part by soft tissue management at the level of the shoulder. We as strength and conditioning coaches should aim to learn about these systems and open discussions with sports medicine and physical therapists about best practices for identifying and manipulating the source of the problem. And finally, consistency is key. In my opinion, soft tissue work should be integrated into every program. If we, as coaches, are able to program a few specific fixtures for the demands of the day's movements, then the coach wins and the athlete is able to embody the connection between mobilization and improved positioning. It is your choice, however, as a coach, whether you wish to integrate soft tissue management fully into each session or whether you would prefer to designate alternative times for implementation. Okay, so now either at the end of our session or the beginning of our session, whichever you prefer, uh, we're going to look at a couple of soft tissue management strategies to, to help uh, preserve hi uh, healthy hips. So first of all, we're going to look at self myofascial release, a foam roller, a tool that pretty much all facilities will have, and I think a really important tool to incorporate into your, your programming. So to begin with, uh, again, just as with our glute bridge series, we're going to look at how um, foam rolling will often be seen done. Um, often we'll see this from, from John, really, really quick passes. Uh, we'll often have one leg maintaining on the ground so we don't have really that much pressure over the foam roller. Okay? And as well, um, we don't have those kind of soft tissue faces of uh, mild, mildly uncomfortable pain that we're kind of seeing when we're doing soft tissue. So um, this is not what we want to see. Really what we want to see um, is really the complete opposite, to be honest. So we're looking for really, really slow, almost, you know, you can't really see how slow the movement is on these passes, so real, real slow. Also, we're gonna look for maybe a little bit of cross flexion, so John might kind of roll side to side a little bit, and also he's gonna move into flexion extension through his knee while he's rolling his quad. So he's actually moving, uh, moving the tissue underneath pressure rather than just rolling the tissue over the pressure. Right, so uh, these are a couple of different techniques we might use here. Also, you know, if you need to assist pressure as well, so for example, John, we might need to really get in there a little bit more. I can assist as a coach or as a fellow athlete here, put some pressure on here. I'm just gonna ask him to relax a little bit and I'm gonna move his leg passively for him whilst I'm assisting pressure. So now I've got some pressure on his hamstring group and also on his quadriceps group onto that foam roll there. Next up, we're gonna to look to uh, release the hip flexors a little bit, often with our field and court athletes, our high agility athletes tend to get very tight uh, in our hip flexor complex. So we're gonna work, uh, work on that right here. So first of all, we've got our, our bench um, ready for our couch positions. We've got our pads um, just to provide a little bit more comfort for the knee. And also we'll integrate a band in a second here as well. So pretty simple uh, couch stretch, nothing ground breaking. John's going to go into uh, a kneeling lunge position, his back foot on the bench, knee on the pad. And what he's going to try and do, actually, I'm going to ask John to try and scoot his knee almost underneath the bench. So we're trying to get this shin as vertical as possible into the ground. And then he's going to sit backwards on towards his heel. Right, so he's really going to feel that. 
mid, high quad and up into that, uh, that hip flexor complex, all right? Um, some athletes really struggle with this. So if they really can't get into that position, we don't mind if they have a little bit more of a forward lean into it and they take the glute a little bit further away from their heel. All right, whatever is, is kind of comfortable for them. But again, we've got to make some changes here. So we really want to push them to, um, to seek those kind of uncomfortable zones where we feel like we're going to make some change. So our couch stretch first, pretty basic. Um, now we're going to go to our kneeling hip flexor series. We're going to use that band as well to help us out. So John's going to put that band around his right leg. Going to get it up nice and high, just below the glute there. Again, purple band for demonstration purposes. Or we'll often use a green or a blue band to assist. So that's really going to assist us into this, into this stretch here. So again, foot on the bench now. We're not too concerned with that knee being close onto the bench. This isn't really a couch stretch anymore, more of a hip flexor stretch. The band is assisting us with that movement. So here we want to make sure that, again, our athletes don't just shoot their hips forward and go into this hyperextension through the spine. We want to engage this right glute, in fact, engage that and stay and keep midline stability through the spine. So here, uh, this is just our basic um, hip flexor stretch position. Here now, John is gonna try and force his hips down a little bit and maybe just a little bit forward, but not too much on that emphasis. We're really looking for down, still engaging that right glute. And now he's gonna raise his right hand high, high above his shoulder. So now we're lengthening out this whole side through uh, that central point of the hip flexor. So this is our position one. Then we're gonna to go to position two where John's gonna lean over. He's gonna try and touch my hand with his hand. He's really leaning over. We're stretching even more. Okay, and then finally, we're gonna rotate uh, in the same direction away from the hip flexor. Again, just providing more length through the hip flexor and stretching there. Okay, so again, we can kind of come into it and out of it if we wanna uh, use that method, or we can hold the positions for a certain period of time. Typically, with, with my sessions, we'll hold those three different positions for about um, 20 to 30 seconds each at a time and then come out of it. Next up, one we might term a band pretzel or a band figure four. Um, this is a simple movement you might see as more of a stretching position, you know, almost like hip cradle or a figure four position. But now we're just going to be doing it in a, in a laying position, and the band's really going to assist us. So it's really going to be more of a, a passive stretch, uh, and the band, the band is assisting us in that. So we have a, a purple band tied to the right there. It's a pretty good resistance level for us. Again, we might go up to a green band if we want a bit more on it. So John's going to uh, scoot up, grab that purple band. He's going to hook it over his right knee there. And it's going to be pretty high up next to his kneecap. He doesn't want it too far down near his hip because we want to use that torque on the band to really uh, peel open the, the front side of the hip. And we're really looking to attack, again, that hip flexor complex. So he's established his uh, pretty typical kind of figure, figure four position. And now that band is helping pull this knee out. Now we might use, again, um, some learnings from yoga and use that kind of deep yoga breathing to breathe into the hip and then exhale. And when we exhale, we allow that knee to go a little bit further. I also like to um, suggest that my athletes, whichever, whichever leg the band is around, to have that same arm. So John's right arm up above his shoulder on the floor. Again, we're just kind of lengthening out that whole side and really trying to focus on relaxing that hip. So again, band figure four. Uh, if you haven't tried it, I really recommend you try this one. It's a good one. Next up, a personal favorite of mine. I've only really uh, discovered this one recently, um, but it's a good one. It's uh, what we call a band hip hamstring. So we've got our purple band on the rack, similar to how we had it with the band pretzel, but it was a little bit higher for that. We've now dropped it down at the foot of the rack. Uh, again, purple band for demonstration purposes. You can really uh, ratchet that up as, as well if you want to. Um, we also have a green band here as well that we're going to use for this stretch too. So John's going to grab that band, similar to the band press, so he's going to hook it around one leg. Um, but this time he's going much higher up towards the, the top of the hip rather than near the knee. So he's got that purple band on there. He's got the green band. He's going to just lie on his back and use that green band as more of just like your kind of typical band-assisted hamstring stretch. So now we have that purple band providing traction, um, pulling the, the head of the femur into the posterior side of the hip. Uh, and now we've also got this kind of hamstring stretch here too. So this is our first position. This is pretty basic. And for some people, this, this might be it. This is really what they're looking for. But if we really want to open out and look at attacking the groin a bit more and the adductors, we can move out to the outside a little bit more, just relax there. Okay, alternatively, if we want to look more so posterior capture of the hip and then all the IT band of the, uh, the glute med, we can come back across the body all the way to the other side um, and provide the stretch there. So again, that purple band is just providing that traction and pulling the head of the femur into different places. Athletes that suffer from a little bit of lower back discomfort um, around the rim of their pelvis 
we're probably going to be helped out by this particular um, mobility and stretch piece. So this is just a banded hip distraction. So again, we're going to use that band to help uh, provide some traction on the leg whilst we move through a couple of small positions. So we've got our purple band on the rack. We've moved it up a little bit higher again, similar to that band pretzel stretch we talked about earlier. Uh, we're going to use a foam roller here too to assist. So John's going to scoot up. He's going to grab that purple band looping it around the bottom side of his, his right heel and then over the top of his feet crisscrossing just to secure that in place. He's gonna grab this foam roller here as well and stick it really underneath kind of the calf or the Achilles and that's just to provide um, a good kind of base of support so that he doesn't have to keep his leg elevated from the ground. So now here again, this purple band is providing traction to the femur. It's pulling the, the head of the femur um, out of the socket just a little bit just to provide some traction and loosen things up in there. Um, and now what John's going to do is he's got his right hand above his shoulder. We talked about that lengthening out that whole side of the body. And he's just going to contract and try and bring the rim of his pelvis up into his armpit as much as he can. Contract there and then relax out and allow that band to almost pull him even further. Kind of that PNF uh, style principle. Again, he can pull up and he can just relax into that. And we can just hang out here for you know, one, two, three minutes just providing that traction. And John's going to get up after this and he's going to feel really good through that hip and particularly the lower back. So like I say, somebody who has those kind of lower back issues and tends to be tight there, this is a nice um, piece of mobility for them. And our final piece of uh, myofascial release and soft tissue work here is going to be a kettlebell with lacrosse ball smash and floss. So. Uh, this is more of a uh, kind of a, a mobility wad term or a CrossFit term with a, with a smash being applying an acute piece of pressure somewhere and then floss, again, moving the muscle belly under that pressure. Okay, So John has a kettlebell and a crossbow by his side. He's going to lie on his back here and he's going to locate the psoas. Um, and typically it's going to be about three fingers distance uh, lateral from the belly button and then three fingers down, right angle. And that's gonna, should sit roughly at the side of the abdominals. And that's really where we wanna dig in, right next to the, the rim of the pelvis there. So John's got a lacrosse ball located there. He's gonna grab that kettlebell and he's gonna sit it on top of the lacrosse ball there and just try and relax as much as possible. Kind of difficult with this, uh, this particular piece of release. And then John's gonna move his right leg through uh, hip flexion and extension. Again, focus on using that psoas. So again, that psoas is shortening under that pressure and then lengthening as well. So again, we've got the smash of the kettlebell on the lacrosse ball and then the floss uh, of the psoas underneath that pressure. So moving through that movement. Again, he's just moving right now in that sagittal plane, but he can open out to the outside a little bit too, allowing his knee to drop out. Again, to kind of find those corners and dig in a little bit more, he could also move the kettlebell, move the ball slightly if he needs to, to find those, uh, those areas that are a little bit um, uh, more aggravated for him. To summarize, here are a few of the most important take-home messages. Where possible, work alongside all staff members to identify and mitigate modifiable risk factors. Though we are motivated to serve our athletes to the best of our ability, be conscious about blurring the boundaries between strength and conditioning and or sports medicine and physical therapy. Seek out professionals in these fields who are great at what they do. Work in synergy with them and communicate often about best practices. Educate your athletes on early warning signs of hip and groin injury and encourage early communication and self-reporting if these signs are identified. And finally, aim to fortify the athletic hip and groin using a holistic approach of prehab and activation, strengthening and soft tissue management strategies. For those of you that are interested in finding out more, here are some resources I use when putting together this presentation. Firstly, the journals. The American College of Sports Medicine's journal, Medicine and Science in Sports and Exercise. The National Strength and Conditioning Association's journal, the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. Aspatar's Sports Medicine Journal, available free of charge through their website. And finally, the British Journal of Sports Medicine's publication. As a practitioner, I would highly recommend the final two resources when looking for digestible information with practical applications. And being British, I of course favour the British Journal of Sports Medicine. What about books? Here are two that I really got stuck into and got a lot out of. Kelly Sturette's Becoming a Supple Leopard and David Joyce's and Daniel Winden's book on sport injury prevention and rehabilitation. 
How about digital media? Well, all of the anatomical figures displayed in this presentation were captured using 3D for Medical's fantastic applications. The one I use the most is Muscle Systems Pro 3 for iPhone, which you can purchase at a minimal price. If you're interested in anatomy and physiology, I would highly recommend taking a closer look at their products. And in the age of the internet, what better way to generate and share ideas than to look to social media? Here are four social media accounts I was influenced by when creating this presentation. And to finish, a couple of acknowledgements and thanks. Thanks firstly to the players and staff of the University of Michigan Rugby Football Club. Thanks to my mentors at Michigan who took a chance on a funny talker back in 2011. That's Coach Favor, Coach Bo Sandoval, and Dr. Mendias, who I studied under for three years as part of orthopedic research. Thanks to Coach McKeefrey, formerly of Eastern Michigan University, now of play. And to my current coaching colleagues at Marquette, Coach Todd Smith, Coach Maggie Smith, Coach Daniel Kent Hull, and Coach Emily Jacobson. And finally, to the Department of Homeland Security for stamping my passport five years ago today. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to talk further about the athletic hip and groin via the email or social media platforms below. Just reach out.